Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Any other questions, or does anybody want to talk about anything? Yes, of course. But wait, 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 one second, one second, one second, one second. I'm going to let someone else ask a question because you interrupted me. Wait patiently without interruption, and then I'll come back to you and let someone else and let you ask. Tough. No, you, you interrupted. I don't want to reward your bad behaviour. Wait. You'll have to wait until someone else has asked a question, and then I come back to you. Any other questions or comments? Sorry, I haven't got Hans and Carrie both asked something about it. I'm just thinking about when you're talking about identity and Christianity. Yeah. Like, how does Christianity overcome identity? Right, great question. So, so, uh, so, so the question is, how does Christianity overcome modernity? We overcome modernity by remembering how we got here. So, desacralization, demystification, De um, secularization, uh, the rise of empiricism and rationalism as the, the 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 means of empiricism, the rise of the nation state, the rise of democratic de democratic universalism, the rise of individualism. We've got to assess how much of these things are compatible with Christianity. Individualism is not compatible with Christianity. Christians believe that the church is the body of Christ. It is a people of God. We believe that the church and the cause of the kingdom should be the focal point of our organization and the telos of all of our politics and economics and social and cultural practice. We should seek to have a Christianized state, a new Christendom. If I could summarize my answer in a single word, it is that as Christians, we need to commit ourselves to establishing a new Christendom in Europe. That is how we overcome modernity. But that doesn't mean that we have to chuck everything out that modernity has brought, because modernity was built from Christian scaffold which means that there are things about modernity that we as Christians can own and possess. Like reason is not against, would you like to come and talk then? Like reason, for instance, is something that is compatible with Christianity. Thomas Aquinas links reason and revelation together. Like democracy, Christianity makes no statement about what system of government we should use. And so democracy and a Christian democracy within Christendom is something that we could work out. So it isn't that we need to reject everything from modernity, but we need to separate those parts of modernity that are not Christian and, and redeem and transform uh, those bits that aren't so that they agree with the Christian faith while embracing those things that modernity took from Christianity anyway. I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let him take a, ask a question, go on. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I'm not good in asking questions, straight questions, but have you studied a little bit of uh, all the religion before Christianity? Okay. Do you have any idea? Right, are you sure you want that to be a question? Yeah. Would you like to have a conversation? Uh, no, no. All right, so the question is, the question is, have I studied ancient religions? And the answer is yes. My degree was in religious studies and I studied all the world's major religions as well as religions that predate Christianity and their interaction with modernity and their interaction with post-modernity. So when I'm talking about religion, I'm talking about my topic. Any other questions or comments? Go on. I really have answered your question. Go on, what's your question? So, you've given us an idea of how to tackle modernity. Sorry? You've given us an idea of how to tackle modernity. Yes. 
say many people say 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 50 years ago, today are giving us ideas of how a new Christendom could look like and they're giving us ideas of uh, what's compatible and what's not compatible Thank with you modernity and Christianity. The, the point is, how does this... Bro, do you want to just come and talk? No, no, I'll just ask a question. Like, what's the question? How does this... Uh, Isolated examples of people living here in this world, or 50 or 100 years yeah. ago, giving ideas of thinking how modernity is incompatible, compatible with Christianity. How does this become some sort of organic, actual? Okay, great uh, question. Enterprise? Yeah, great question. Otherwise, it's just going to fizz Yeah, out. no, no, you've you've a very good question. The reality is that up until very recently, Christians were not talking about re-establishing Christendom. This is something that has only emerged in the last 10 years, last 20 years. It's not something that is, um, that is recent. Christians are rediscovering that if we believe as Christians that the Lordship of Christ and the Christian faith should affect our politics and that we can be involved in politics as Christians, that the next logical question is, well, what is a Christian political project? We've only just won the debate amongst ourselves that as Christians, Christianity can engage with politics and Christians can engage with politics. So now the next question is, to what end should we be involved in politics? And to the, the answer to that, that is emerging amongst Christians who have thought about that question, is that we as Christians should commit ourselves to a new Christendom, that we should establish a Christian state amongst a confederacy of Christian states. Now, how do we make that real? Firstly, we educate ourselves. We make sure that we understand why we believe that. If you say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and you say that Jesus is Lord, but then you don't say that Christians should govern the country in a Christian way, then you're either denying that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, or you're denying that Jesus is Lord of the whole of your life. Because what you're saying is, Jesus is Lord of everything except my politics. When we talk, so firstly, we've got to educate ourselves. Then we have to organize. And the best model of organization for Christian churches is to adopt what's called the Benedict Option. The Benedict Option is to create Christian majorities in geographical areas where Christians are the majority. Where Christians then elect who's going to represent them in the council, who's going to represent them in the parliament, who's going to enter into the school governing board and decide the curriculum of the school, that the majority of Christians in the school are Christians, that the, 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 the police recruit from amongst Christians, that those councils and the police and the schools start celebrating a Christian culture and forming a Christian culture. And that is how you start making it into an organic reality. You said you didn't want to have a discussion. I offered it twice. I'm going to take a question from someone else and then come back to you. Any other questions or comments about any aspect to the Christian faith? Now's your chance. Going once. Going twice. Any questions or comments about anything to do with Christianity, our history, our culture, our identity, our beliefs? Okay, well, go on. So how do you get this, like, so the movement towards Catholic communities, real geographical Catholic, uh, sorry, Christian, I'm Catholic, came up. Yeah, yeah. Communities, it's the movement towards Christendom. Yeah. But how do you, again, the question, to not to push the question back any further again, how do you get Christian communities? Right. Because, because it's all well in say about so, so So let me talk about that. How, how do you get Christian communities? Well, firstly, you start practicing it yourself in your own church. 
Like, so many Catholic churches, since you mentioned that you're a Catholic, I'm going to pick on the Catholic Church. So many Catholic churches are utterly rubbish parishes. You go there on a Sunday and nobody wants to talk to one another the moment Mass is finished. They just want to clear out as quickly as they can. There's no life in so many Catholic churches. They're just dead sacramental churches where you go to get the sacraments on a Sunday and then there's no life outside of that. That has to change. But there's another way that you can build this kind of Benedict community. Catholic churches start working with Protestant churches, start working with Orthodox churches, and they do that through what's called the local uh, leadership group. Most areas, most cities, most communities have a network where the, the church leaders meet together as a group usually just to offer emotional support, maybe a bit of advice. But those nascent collections of Christian leaders could actually be the starting point of real Christian activism and unity, where Christians act in the first instance in unity about the things that they're against. Because Protestants, Catholic and Orthodox all agree we're against abortion, we all agree that we're against divorce. We all agree that we are against Islamization. So why don't we organize about the things that we're against? Then on top of that, we can start celebrating and unifying on the things that we agree upon. Like the fact we all agree that Jesus is Lord. We all agree that there's 27 books in the New Testament. We all agree that the church is a real thing that the apostles are the foundation of the church, that Matthew wrote Matthew and Luke wrote Luke and John wrote John, and let's build on the things that there's just obvious agreement about. And where we disagree, let's not fight about it because there are bigger things to fight about. Liberalization is a bigger concern for us to fight about. Islamization is a bigger thing to fight for. Um, again, sorry. Persecution of Christians is a bigger thing to fight. And so we need to unite about our common causes. You said you didn't want a discussion, let someone else ask a question. And this is the way that we build that community by getting to know other Christians in our local geographic area and uniting on the places and ways that we can unite. Any other questions or comments about any aspect of the Christian faith, our beliefs, our history, our traditions, our culture, our politics? This is your chance. Go on. Going once. This is your chance, guys. Going twice. Okay, bro. Over to you. I think that's good, I agree. Are you sure you don't just want to come and have a conversation? No, I'm all right, yeah. All right. I just don't like the cameras. And the thing, right? but, Do you want to have a conversation from there? Uh, I'll just, I don't know, it's up to you. Right, Let, let's just talk then. Me and you talk. All you right. stay off camera, I'll stay on camera. All right. I, I want to have much to say, but I'll, I'll go. Yeah, go on. All right, so I, th I agree with you. I think, like, obviously Christian communities need to form and they need to keep going and they need to be strengthened. Yeah. But there seems to be a problem in the jump between actually, if you ha if you take the average Christian, strong Christian community in London or anywhere else, most of the time there are people commuting from uh, from far out into somewhere. Yeah. Even in, even in the suburbs, even somewhere else. Yep. Yep. They're driving to a car park. Yeah. So how do you incentivize? Because there is no, we haven't got the Jewish uh, law, for example, that forbids us from starting a car engine. Yeah. Day, yeah. How do you incentivize actually people uh, living together in geographical areas? Otherwise, it's always going to be a disbanded. Well, well, firstly, we've we've got to recognize something as Christians, which is that the models of church that we're using in the West aren't working. They're not working. Your mega church is not working. Your parish church is not working. Your gathered church is not working. All of the models of church that we use are not working in the Western world. The parish church itself uh, assumed that people couldn't travel very far, like people can travel further. My advice is that as Christians, you should move closer to the church that you attend, like move in. 
Like if you've got to travel an hour there, you might as well just move in to the local area. And then if enough people from a church do that, then you start to be able to build the kind of Benedict communities that we need. Because what we need to do as Christians is start rebuilding a Christian society from the ground up. And we build it from the ground up when we are the majority. And the way to be the majority is simply to move in with one another, to evangelize around your edges, and to evangelize within the area that you move into, and thus convert more and more people. And that's how you do it. If you doubt that this model works, if you doubt this model works, ask yourself, why does the Muslim community have such disproportionate impact on our society? Why are they so successful? It's because they're adopting Benedict option, they're adopting Benedict style communities. And it's not just working for Muslims, it works for Jews. Go to Golders Green and ask yourself who dominates Golders Green. Doesn't just work for Muslims and Jews, it also works for Christians. If you go to America, the fastest growing religion in America is the Amish Church. And they're a Benedict style community. And they're doing it because they're great at creating families. And that's the way that you start rebuilding Christendom. Go on. Incentivizing Christians to live. Doesn't want to be on camera. Incentivizing Christians to move to, to an area together. Yeah. That in a sense implies a, a new theology, theological emphasis. Because a theological emphasis. Yes, right? yes, yes, it does. And one that, as you said, the mainstream Christian churches aren't emphasizing right now. You said they're not working. Yeah. So in a sense, you've got something of an outside, outsider uh, uh, vision yep. with different theological emphasis, which yep. emphasize community yep. and living together yep. and incentivizing living together. Yep. And then you've got a current mainstream Christian churches which somehow aren't incentivizing that. Yep. So, so, what, so let me just address that point. So what is this new theological emphasis that we need? Because you're right to discern that that's exactly what we are talking about. As Christians, what is this new theological emphasis? The church exists as a formal structure that you think of when you think church, with a, with a pastor or a priest or a bishop, but it also exists as an informal collection of relationships. Put your hand up if you're a Christian right now, right? This is an expression of church. It's an informal gathering of the church. We're being church right now, right? And the, 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 the new theological emphasis that we need is to value more the informal existence of the church, the informal relationships of the church, and to recognize that we are fully church even when we're not going to church on a Sunday, even when the pastor isn't organizing something, even when we're not doing something in the church building. And we need to recognize that that actually is where a lot of the life that will rebuild the church exists. Now that can't be separate from, it can't be divorced from um, the, the, the formal structures of the church. Whatever church you go to, keep going to it, right? There's a great group here in London, in Acton. I think they're called the Sword of the Spirit. They're a collection of Christians that have come from all different kinds of denominations, right? Don't push people back, please. Right, they're, they're, they're all kinds of different denominations, right? Come closer, guys, please. Like all the cameras are pushing you back, like there's no need to be frightened. Thank you. So all of these, all of these, th this group, it's collected by a number of Christians from different denominations, Protestant, Catholics, and Orthodox, have all moved into the same area. And all of, those church, all of those Christians are faithful to the denomination that they belong to. The Protestants go to their Protestant church on a Sunday, the Catholics to their Catholic church, the Orthodox to the Orthodox church. And if their church is doing something midweek, they go to that church, right? But 
in the middle of all of that, they are in and out of one another's houses. They're eating together. They're having connection with one another. They're supporting one another when a brother needs to move house or when a sister is pregnant. They form like this little village in Acton made up of them. And that is something that we can replicate. It doesn't mean that you abandon your formal church. It just means that you start to value more the informal relationships of being Christians with one another, around one another's homes, at the coffee table, in the cafe, in the local pub, at the local supermarket, that kind of thing. Go on. Yeah, so I've been to that community, the Antioch community. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I agree with you. I think there are, there, are, there are potential good models for how Christians are different uh, communities. So there's your model, bro. That's how you do it. Yeah, but even they would say that it hasn't been successful in uh, building a residential community. Yeah. They would say that we tried it and we and people have moved away and it, 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 it lost steam. Yeah. And this is, this is it. It's like, how can we have with the institutional historic... Yep. Christian uh, churches yeah. and, their, and their structures, yeah. which seem to be, as you say, failing, yeah. and seem to be contrary to this theological emphasis. Yeah. How can how can a new theological emphasis be sustained? Okay, you've got to, you've got to build the infrastructure. The reason why the Antioch Church has struggled is because London is a very hard place to live in full time, unless you're rich. Rents are going up. All the costs are going up. Property is hard to buy. The church needs to buy the infrastructure. You need to buy property, basically, and, and then move people into it. If I was a bishop of a church, I'd sell off all of my failing parishes, and then I'd build a block of flats right next to my cathedral, and I'd move all my congregation inside my block of flats so that they got to walk five minutes to the cathedral. You've got to build the infrastructure if you want this idea to work. And the only way, every problem that Christians face, whatever the problem is, it can always be solved by throwing more bodies at it. If a problem is too big for you, deal with it as a group. If it's too big as a group, deal with it as a congregation. If it's too big for a congregation, deal with it as a network. It's just about L of cascading upwards the amount of resources that we throw at any problem. Unfortunately, because so many Christians and their churchianity has been so parochial, so me and my fellowship, a lot of our problems now have developed to such a systematic level that they can no longer be dealt with by the local congregation. And so as Christians, we need to be thinking outside of the local congregation. The Antioch community failed, because they didn't buy the buildings. I would disagree. I think. Did they buy buildings? I think they bought houses. And How many? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not a member. Yeah. But well, I think I disagree in the sense that it's all about it's about infrastructure and bodies. I think the dream comes first. I agree. I think, yes. Yeah. I think I think people are willing to sacrifice. No, I agree with you. The vision comes first. You've got to get people on board with this idea, which is why I talk about the Benedict community. A lot of us are married to church models that don't work. The Benedict option works. That I'm telling you as a sociologist of religion that the Benedict option works. All the evidence shows that it works and it works for whoever uses it. You don't even have to be religious. It works for political groups. Look at Northern Ireland. There you had two Benedict style communities going toe to toe for the last 50, 70 years. Why? Because they formed Benedict communities based upon their different politics. And each one was able to sustain itself against the other. The reason why churches close in Muslim areas isn't because suddenly the whole congregation converts to Islam. It's actually because one or two Christians convert to Islam. Maybe the congregation converts one or two Muslims to Christianity. But most Christians eventually just move out or grow old and die. And then the church, because it can't convert enough people, ends up closing. And thus you lose another church. Benedict style communities crush any other model of church that you want to think of. If we want the church to survive, 
we have to adopt the Benedict option. So yes, the vision comes first, but then you've got to build the infrastructure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I have anything else to say. I just think that on, I think the vision that comes first, and I, I just see that the, the traction for this new, uh, I hope, I really pray and hope that this uh, new theological emphasis take, gets 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 on, off the ground and gets running. Yeah. I just, I'm just a bit skeptical of that because because it relies it relies on new institution. New institution. No, no, you've, you've, you've missed the... No, 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 I'm not saying that you leave your institution. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the Antioch community is a new institution in itself, right? It's new institutional forms of living. Yeah. Right? That's what. That's where, how I'm using my... Yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough, right? I understand. And so this whole new theological emphasis relies on a lot of innovation. Yes. On, on, a, on cultural level, yeah. on an institutional level, yep. on an uh, ethics yep. level. Yep. Oh, a whole mass like movement towards this dream yes and it just seems to me unlikely because the historic churches are against unconsciously against this development yep it just seems to me without a, 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 a broad broadly a level of geniuses and saints so and let saints so, 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 so let me reply to this right. and, and and the reply is simply guys you're gonna get there whether you want to or not right at the, way, at the rate at which the church is collapsing in the West, only Benedict-style communities will manage to exist in the future. Or none, where, where, or none at all, exactly. So your choice is either run ahead of the curve or be dragged there by the curve. But if you get dragged there by the curve, you'll get there too late. And then it'll be really questionable about whether anything can be recovered at all. But if you get there ahead of the curve, then as Christians, we will find ourselves with a multiplying effect of our own resources, our own bodies, our own energy, our own people, enough that we can start a bounce back, enough that we can start to push back. Yes, it involves reimagining things. It does. But why is that a problem except for the fact that we're creatures of habit? And I would say to us that we need as Christians to be operating more out of hope and more out of faith and more out of commitment than operating out of fear or suspicion. And the reality is, guys, that the truth is that as Christians, the church has always changed. It has always changed to deal with its circumstances. And it needs to now change again for the circumstances that it finds itself in within modernity. The parish model does not work. Your mega church model does not work. Your gathered church model where people are driving in from two hours away does not work. All of those churches will in time die. The only way that we can build a church is to build a church using the Benedict option that is fiercely evangelistic and is deliberate about creating families, about helping men and women to meet one another and to marry and to have children and to support children. And again, I give you the evidence. The Jewish community that adopts the Benedict option is the Orthodox Jewish community. They're the growing Jewish community. The Muslims have adopted in the West the Benedict Option. They're a growing community. They're making converts. They're having families. They're having children. The Amish community in America adopts the Benedict Option and they are the fastest growing religion in America. And they're doing it just through families. They're not even bothering to evangelize because they're so great at creating youth and then holding on to their youth. And so as Christians, we need to create an identity that is different from Western identity so that Christians, they feel that the West is alien to them so that they don't apostatize and get absorbed into Western liberalism. We've got to create a culture amongst Christians that is alien to the West. And that means we have to live out our faith fully in a way that is different to Western society so that our youth feels the West to be strange, alien, different, and not wish to be a part of it. It's, it seems to me that the, the only way that this is going to be sustained over generations is, 
is if the incentives go on the incentives to live together in the residential community are inspired by a theological emphasis which is ranked high in the system of one's theology yeah i agree so well, i'm just wondering to, to you i'm just wondering have you wondered and a thought of some of the uh the makeup of how this sort of uh, hierarchy, new hierarchy of values in this system, say, of emphasis, uh, would look like in order to sustain over generations a long time. Have you thought about, like, you know, because it involves organization, liturgy, it involves, you know, involves all these, uh, yep. how, one, how one looks at the yep. Christian history. Yeah. Have you thought, well, yeah. I, I think, again, we've got to go back to the Antioch community in Acton as a good model. Like, the thing is, you've got to constantly work at building community. I think that the reason maybe why the Acton community thinks that their model has failed isn't, isn't necessarily because there's something wrong with the model, but something along with, uh, wrong with the way that they've implemented it. Perhaps they were not evangelistic enough, or perhaps they were not evangelistic in an effective way, or perhaps they weren't doing enough to recruit new Christians to move into the area, or facilitating such movement. I know I tried to join the acting community and they weren't too brilliant at getting me in and I was banging on the door. So it strikes me that their failing, if there, were, if there is failure, came from the fact that they didn't have enough way, easy ways in. The, the, the theological shift has to be as Christians in the first instance and we've got to recognise that this is a generational project. It's not that we accomplish it in our generation, but that we set the grounding for the next generation also to build. And that's what as Christians we need to be doing, is thinking generationally. What do we need to do in our generation to set the next generation up so that they're in a good place to advance and to teach them to think generationally so they do the same for the third generation and the fourth generation. But too much of our church leadership only thinks about our congregation, me and my church, and only thinks about now, rather than the future, rather than the kingdom. So it's about emphasis on the kingdom, it's about emphasis on the informal church, it's about emphasis on Christian unity. The, these are the, some of the dynamics that we need to emphasize. We, and they're all there in the Christian faith, we just need to bring them to the front of our thinking. Any other questions or comments about anything you've heard? Go on, bro. Hey, Bob. Um, so I heard some of your, of your, of your time speaking about the more masculine Christianity. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by that, uh, to emphasize more? So what do I mean by a more masculine Christianity? How many of you have gone into a church as men and have been put off by some gooey, goopy kind of love song to Jesus? And that made you feel awkward. Right, there you go, right? How many of you have become frustrated at the fact that the church only wants you to go to men's breakfasts? It doesn't want you to go out and to confront the enemies of the church. How many of you? Two, right? How many of you have noticed that there aren't many men in your church? Put your hand up. Is your church majority women? Put your hand up if your church is majority women. Wow, really? Yeah. There's a reason for that. Why? There's a reason for that. Why, why, why? Because church leadership does everything it can to stop men being men. Why? I'll tell you. What, what, what do men like? Men like to gather into groups. We like to take sides. We like competition. We're not frightened of conflict. We're not, we're not frightened of standing up for what we believe in. We want to belong to a group of men that are fighting to a cause. Put your hand up if that sounds attractive. Right, there you go, most of you. That's the, what I'm talking about when I talk about masculine Christianity. I'm talking about allowing men to form brotherhoods, to form groups that are willing to, to, to stand up against the opposition of the church 
to stand up against the Islamists, to stand up against the liberal progressives, to stand up against the communists, to stand up against the fascists, and to engage in a way that is not timid or fearful, ladies and gentlemen. When we produce fellowships like that, men will find their place in those fellowships. When those fellowships exist, women will join those fellowships. The problem with us is that we've emasculated Christianity in the West and we have done it because comfortable church leaders don't want to deal with the messiness that masculine energy brings because masculine energy gets involved. It does practical things. It, it defends its community. And we need to cultivate this kind of masculine energy. I just want to say again, that once again, Shalina is bringing nothing good to the corner. She's just creating heat without substance. She's causing problems. And when she's in trouble, it's Christian men that are going to have to go and defend her. Please, Shalina, stop what you're doing. You're not helping. Any other questions or comments? Wait, wait, he, you asked loads of questions. Go on. Sorry? Yeah. So what, what is my answer to Andrew Tate? This is a message directly to Andrew Tate and to any of Andrew Tate's fans. You, you proclaim that you had converted to Islam because of the degeneracy of the West. But Islam is degenerate. Polygamy is degenerate. Abortion is degenerate. Divorce is degenerate. You've adopted one form of degeneracy because you rejected another form of degeneracy. How are you not degenerate, Andrew? And let's face it, Islam isn't doing you much good. You're still there naked on camera you're still there smoking away you're still there i don't know if you still own a, a brothel and a cam business but if you do it's clearly not helping you i've got a better idea real masculinity is that which is embodied in the christian chivalric tradition that means a man who is faithful to his commitments he is someone who tries to walk in virtue. He is someone who defends the weak. He is someone who stands up against injustice. He is someone who guards his heart as much as he can from temptation. He is someone who guards his heart as much as he can from sin. And I'm saying that as a sinner, by the way. And he is someone who is not frightened to fight for what is good. Andrew Tate is someone whose life is filled with vice, pride, lust, vanity. He boasts in money, not virtue. He boasts in worldly accomplishments. He boasts in polygamy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a man. This is just a chav. This is just a chav who's taken a shahada and it's not doing any good. Real men, real men stand up for what is true and what is noble and what is virtuous and they embrace their cross. They embrace suffering in the cause of truth, in the cause of virtue. Not like these jihadi thugs who go around harassing women and old men trying to show how brave they are for Islam. These kittens. We as Christians must be able to stand up for one another and to stand up for the church. And that's my answer to Andrew Tate. Any other questions or comments? Go on, bro. So, would you say there's a similarity between the theological emphasis needed to build residential communities and the theological, new theological emphasis in order to build a Christianity. Yes, it's exactly similar, isn't it? they, they, they synergize. To build a masculine Christianity and to build a Benedict church involves sacrifice, it involves commitment. You've got to make things happen. Well, that is the very definition of masculine energy, is that you make things happen. 
You don't just wait for someone else to do it. You take on as much responsibility as you can to see the change that you want to see. That's what is lacking in our church because our leaders don't want men to do that. Because if you start dealing with the real problems in our congregation and in our congregations, the, the, the church leaders lose a bit of your energy. But as Christians, we need to fight for the right to build a masculine spirituality that is acceptable and accepted in the wider church. And part of doing that, dealing with the real problems that the church faces, is building a Benedict community. Brother, you had a question. Violence. Let, let, because your voice is very noisy, bro, and your voice is very quiet. Are you saying that the, do we have a moral responsibility for violence? Yes. Right. So let's deal with the violence question. Firstly, I want to prefix everything that I'm about to say by saying that I don't, I'm not encouraging any of you to break the law or to act outside of the law. I'm not encouraging vigilantism in any form or way. However, Christianity does not teach pacifism. Jesus does not teach pacifism. The apostles do not teach pacifism. If you believe, as it says in Romans, that the state has the right to bear the sword and to use the sword, and if you believe that the apostles were right to try and convert King Agrippa and the Caesar of Rome, and if you believe that Christians should be involved in politics, then you believe that Christians can wield the sword. And so as Christians, we do have a moral use of violence. It is a moral use of violence for the state to crush jihadi movements. It is a moral use of violence for the state to stop anti-fascista. It is a moral use of violence for the state to stop members of the Ku Klux Klan going into black churches and shooting them up. Or for neo-Nazis to be stopped from attacking synagogues. And as Christians, we would be fully okay with that use of violence. It was morally right to bomb ISIS. It was morally right to fight the Ottoman Empire. It was morally right to defend, and is still morally right, to defend Christians in Nigeria and in Pakistan and in Syria and in Lebanon and in Cyprus and in the Philippines and in Burma.